Hi, the Mud Broker here. Today I am going to make roast pork with a honey cayenne glaze in this monstrous old old roaster I recently acquired. This thing is big. I mean this is a full-scale turkey sized roaster. Got a nice lid for it. You can see it is in quite perfect condition. There's some pitting on the inside and it doesn't have the trivet for it. It is, hopefully facing the right direction, which I'm not. It's a favorite wear number three. You can see that there. It's a favorite wear number three oval roaster. They made four sizes of these, zero, one, two, and three. Three being the biggest. And like I said, this thing is pretty big. You can see it covers both burners on my stove pretty easily. And it's about the size of a bathtub. I was planning on doing a beef roast, but it's Labor Day weekend and all of the uh, bigger cuts of meat have been pretty much snapped up by the tourists looking to grill something on their grill. And uh, beef is kind of expensive nowadays anyway, so I went with pork because my local grocery store had some beautiful pork butts for $1.59 a pound, and you can't beat that price. So what I'm going to do is show you how to make these up. Now, if you don't have an enormous cast iron roaster, you can use a regular roasting pan for this. And I'm doing two at the same time, so I'll have a few days worth of meat made up in advance, so I have something for lunch. But, I'm going to set this aside, and actually what I'm going to do is set him aside, and I'm going to get out my frying pan, which I have, I have my oven preheated, and I'm warming up my frying pan in there a little bit beforehand. I'm going to take that out, and I'm going to put in my roasting pan, mostly to get it out of the way, but it'll help to preheat it a little bit and warm it up. Now even though Favorite, favorite is a uh, pretty lightweight brand as far as vintage cast iron goes, that's a substantial chunk of iron. It's pretty heavy. Now what I'm going to do is start off, as I usually do as soon as I find my glass, with a nice drink because, as always, alcohol is the first and most important ingredient to any recipe and today I'm going to have me a little bit of Irish whiskey, some nice red bush. Aaron go bra. Anyway, I'm going to get my pan heating up already fairly warm. Well, I'll get them warmed up good. And while that's warming up, I am going to salt and pepper my roast first. Now I've rinsed these off and patted them dry, as dry as I can get them. And I'll give them a good sprinkling of salt and pepper. Probably should have poured a little of this out into a dish first, it would have been easier. But, give them a good peppering on this side. Pat that down a bit. Flip them over and I'll do the other sides. Like I said, these are some really nice Cut some meat. I'm gonna check and see how my pan is doing. It's doing pretty good. So I'll start throw a little bit of clarified butter in there, get that melting, get it warming up good. What I want to do is sear this meat off a bit before I put it in the roaster. I'm gonna be pretty generous with my clarified butter. I'll even maybe a little more generous than that. There we go. Where was I? Okay, pepper. Back to the pepper. Pepper these guys up. And then I'll rub that in good. Grab my 
hotpad. And I want my oil good and hot because I want to sear these on all the sides. I keep forgetting that I had this in the oven so the handle is hotter than it usually would be at this stage. Usually it takes a bit for the handle to get hot when you're frying things on a cast iron pan. So I'm in the habit of just kind of grabbing the handle and moving it around, which isn't the best idea. Where'd my paper towel go? Wipe my hands off. And I had my big meat fork and a big spatula already. But of course, they've moved away on me. Now, I've got those ready to go. I want to warm this up. Turn my heat up a bit more, that's why it ain't hot. Big skillets like this, you want to heat them up slowly. That's part of the reason why I preheated it in the oven. And I had it on medium at first to heat it up more. But now i got to crank her up fairly high because I want to sear these good. And I forgot to do that sooner. Now hopefully this won't splatter up onto my camera lens from there, but it shouldn't. And if it does, I'll have to pause and clean my lens off. And it does warm up if you leave the damn thing sitting on the uh, burner. Now these, okay, she's starting to, just starting to smoke. So I'll put this in fat side down. And it should just barely fit in there. If I don't get it perfectly seared all the way around, I can live with it. But the better job you do of searing it to start off with, the better off you are. Now this will take a few minutes to do both of these, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, take a little break and I'll be back when I got these both seared off and ready to go into the roaster. Okay, I've got this one all seared on all sides. This one here I'm still working on, i got one side left. Now, you got to be careful working with a big piece of meat like this. I find that a meat fork and a wide spatula work really good because you don't want this to tip over and flop on you and you'll slop hot grease on yourself and you don't want to slop hot grease on yourself but this will just take you know probably another 30 40 seconds on this one edge and you can see how nice that's brown there and this one here is all browned up good all the way around and we're just about done with this, that part of it Now, something a lot of people say about cast iron is that it can be made to be non-stick. That isn't exactly true. It can't be made entirely non-stick. Proteins like meat or eggs or fish will always stick to cast iron until they start to brown and cook a bit. Then they'll release. No matter what kind of pan you use, even if you try and flip, if you try and flip an egg over too soon, it's going to stick and be a pain. And the same thing applies to cast iron. It applies to meat. So rock this back and forth. Now that's released good, so I'm pretty sure that it's browned. Gonna fish this out. Yeah, that did brown good enough. Put these aside. Sit. Whoop, little pop there. Set this off to the side. We'll be back with that in a minute. I'm gonna turn my heat off. That's off put that on there that'll probably smoke a little bit and I'm gonna grab my roast nub my roaster now we'll get this out I will set my lid over here set the roaster on there 
those mountain back up. And I'm going to take these two nice, big, beautiful pieces of meat and put them in the roaster with the fat side up. Yeah, you can hear that sizzling because the roaster is already nice and hot. And that's good. I'll get underneath this one, put him in, and they should both fit. Now these will shrink up a good deal in the roaster. Now, I don't need these anymore, but I can set my lid over here. And I'm going to pour the oil from my pan into the roaster. Pour that over there. I'm going to set the lid on just for a moment. Set the whole thing aside. And that's a pretty good bit of weight there, boys. Kick that back off. Wipe a little grease on there so it smokes nice. Put that on. Make sure the pan is still good and hot. I'll turn it up to kind of medium high heat. And what I want to do now is deglaze this pan. By deglazing, I want to get all them little fried on bits off of there. So now she's good and hot. I have some very hot water. And I'll just put that on the pan. I shouldn't have ran away with my spatula just yet, but I got a spoon handy. I kind of scrape that around a little bit and get all them bits and pieces off the bottom of your pan because there's a lot of flavor in there. And it would have been nice if my pan was a little bit hotter, but it's working pretty good. Those little burnt on bits and pieces professional chefs call that the fond and whenever you're making a pan sauce or something like that you want to get that off by deglazing your pan you simply add a little liquid whether it's water or broth beef stock chicken stock or wine whatever you're cooking with you just add that to it stir it around knock any little loose bits off of there I think we got it pretty good and I'll pour this over my rolls and I'll rinse it off a little bit more. This also helps to clean the pan. It gets most of the stuff off there before you have to worry about cleaning it off. A couple little bits and pieces here and there and get the last of them. Pour that on and I've got a little bit of water in the bottom of the pan, a little bit of oil. I'll give her just a little bit more water. Turn my heat back off Actually, I'm going to set that here where it isn't on the heat. Grab my lid. We'll put the lid on here. And this whole thing now goes into the oven. I have it preheated to about 310 degrees. I want to roast these nice and slow. So I'll open her up. Lift this big heavy thing into the oven. And there we are, into the oven. Now I showed off this roaster on my uh, live stream this week. And a lot of people ask me, will that thing actually fit in your oven? Well, yes, you can see that it does. Not a lot of room in there for anything else, but the roaster does fit. It also fits in the oven of my wood stove, so I can use it in my wood cook stove later on, too. I almost forgot. Like I said, this is a 310 degree oven. I want to roast this nice and slow. Now how long it's going to take, it's kind of hard to say. Those are pretty good sized chunks of meat and I'm roasting them slow. What I want to do is cook them to an internal temperature of about 145 to 150 degrees. That will give me a nice medium, medium rare. And yes, it's safe to cook pork to that level. It's even recommended by the National Pork Association and the USDA. So you can get away with cooking your pork. It doesn't have to be dried out leather pork to be done. I'll be back once this is getting closer to being done and once it's closer to being done I'll show you how to make the glaze for it. 
All right, my roast has been going for a couple hours now. I'm going to pull them out because it's too heavy to just slide the rack out and do it down by the oven, so i got to take it all the way out. And... We'll see how she's going. Big cloud of steam. Hopefully I won't steam over my lens for too long. Check my temperature. Well, it's coming along good. I'm up to about 115 degrees inside. So I got an hour and a half, two hours left maybe. Maybe a little less. I'm going to add some veggies. I bet you thought I forgot these, didn't you? Got some nice, fresh, locally grown red potatoes and carrots. I'll throw these guys in cover them back up and put them back in the oven. Before long, I'll start making the glaze so that's ready to go when it's time to go. And I want to put that on for the last half hour, 45 minutes of cooking. So we'll get this back in the oven and we'll get back to it, cooking it. I have roughly an hour's worth of cooking time left on my roasts. So what I'm going to do now is get my glaze ready. What you need is a quarter cup of cider vinegar, one cup of honey, toss that, two cups of brown sugar. When you measure this out, you'll want to pack it down lightly in the measuring cup. Scrape that off. A half a cup of Dijon mustard. about two to three tablespoons of butter, about that much, and scrape this guy off again, about a teaspoon, eh, a good heaping teaspoon anyway, of cinnamon, ginger, and a little closer to two teaspoons of cayenne pepper. I put this all in a pan, get her going over kind of medium low heat, at least to start off with. I want to get this all dissolved and melted together. And I want to bring this up to a gentle boil, up to a, yeah, a gentle boil, and kind of simmer it for a while. I'll be back once I got everything simmering along. I brought our glaze up to a full boil, and then turned the heat way down, and let it simmer for five or six minutes, so it should be ready to go. Get just a little bit there so it cools off fast, because something with a lot of sugar and honey in it will stay hot for a long time and really burn you if you're not careful. Oh, that is really, really good. It's sweet, but it's got a little bit of mustard bite to it, and the uh, cayenne, cinnamon, and ginger really give it a nice spiciness. So what I'm going to do is turn the heat off and uh, I'll cover this up. We want this nice and hot when we put it on the meat. I'm going to check the meat quick and see if that's ready to be glazed yet. Where'd my thermometer go?
Yep, yeah, we're ready to glaze that. I'm up to about 140 degrees, so I don't have a real long time left on my cooking. So, what I will do is get this entirely out of the way. Grab a trivet. Get this entirely out of my way. Get the meat out. good. Now I'm going to move these veggies to the side as best I can. Move you. And I'm going to pour our glaze on. I guess I didn't need to cover this after all because I'm using it up right away. I'll pour some of that glaze on there some on them veggies. And the rest of it I will brush around so that everything gets a nice coating. I'm going to put this back in the oven, crank the heat up to 375 and leave it uncovered. Should take about a half hour or so until the temperature of the meat gets up to about 150. 145 to 150 should be what I'm looking for. All right. Make sure everything's got a little bit of glaze on it. Doesn't that look good? Last little bit of that. Okay. Back in the oven we go. And we're just about done. Oh, that looks so good. It smells amazing. All right, turn my oven up. Blast this a little bit. And we'll be back when it's done. All right, this is ready to come out of the oven. Let's see what we got. Ugh. Looky there. It would have been nice to have a trivet for this because you can see there's liquid coming up around the sides, but actually, these have displaced quite a bit, so there's not much room for the liquid. And getting it up off the bottom a little bit with a trivet would have let the sides roast a little bit better, especially after I add the glaze, that add more liquid to it. But let me get these potatoes out of here and carrots. Get these dug out, then I'll get my roasts out. But the smell is just amazing on this. soft. So the potatoes are done. The last couple of carrots. A couple of little ones hiding in there. I'll get him later. Now to fish these roasts out, um, what's going to be easiest? I'll try with a spatula and fork. Oops. 
those are just fantastic. And I noticed that glaze seems to really thicken up the juice quite a bit. I mean, it's almost got its own gravy already. So I'm not going to mess with that instead of uh, thickening it up. Usually if I was going to make gravy, I would dissolve some flour in cold water, bring this up to a boil, turn both burners on, get this up to a boil, and then stir in the uh, flour and water to thicken it up. But it's fairly thick all on its own, so I'm not going to mess with it. But what I will do is take some of that juice and ladle it onto my plate with uh, meat. I don't want to wash my glaze off, but I do want to get some of that juice in there. Now I'm going to let this sit and rest for five or six minutes before I try cutting into it. Okay, I let my meat rest for about five minutes. You should always let meat rest before you go cutting into it. Just leave it set for five minutes or so and it'll reabsorb the juices and relax. It'll be a lot better than if you cut into it. and It tends to dry out a bit more when you do that. So I'll need a couple of slices off the end here. Big thick slice. Oh, it's nice and juicy. And it is definitely cooked all the way down through to the bone. Grab myself some carrots, a couple of potatoes, need that and smash these potatoes a little bit. And I'm going to take a little bit of the juice from the pan, which is just off screen here. Put that on my potatoes like gravy. Maybe a little on the meat too. And we'll give this a taste test and see how she turned out. If it smells half as good as it tastes, and I'll taste half as good as it smells, this is really going to be something. Oh, that is good. That glaze really, really has a nice spicy sweetness to it. And it uh, goes really fantastic with the pork. So, go ahead and give this a try. It's not terribly hard. You don't have to have a big cast iron roasting pan like that one. They're kind of hard to come by, and it's not really on the screen, so. They're kind of hard to come by, although you can find fish cookers which are long and fairly deep. There's also things called ham boilers which are pretty similar. They're a little bit different shape but they're also oblong like this and uh, fairly deep so a smaller roast you can do. This one you could do a full-size turkey in but like I said ones that big are kind of hard to come by but you can certainly do this in a regular roasting pan and I really hope you do it because this turned out just fantastic. If you have a trivet or a rack to put in the bottom, it does help quite a bit because it keeps the juice from coming up too high on the sides of the roast and lets the sides more roast. But even if you don't, it's still going to be amazingly good. So I hope you enjoyed the video. I'll see you on the next one. Thanks for watching and goodbye.